Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Um, this is joint work with Peter Siraki. Um, the big question, or the overarching question we're trying to ask in this paper is, how well does, how does the market for CEOs work? How does the labor market for CEOs work? And how well does it work? And I, given the audience, I probably don't need to say much about that, but there's quite a bit of accumulated empirical evidence at this point that CEOs genuinely do have an effect, genuinely do matter for firm performance and value. Um, which then, if, if we believe that, then it also suggests that the CEO labor market should matter, right? So now it suddenly becomes important to match the right person to the right firm. And I would argue that we actually don't know what's the right model. We don't have a really good, cons good consensus in the literature what's the right model to describe that CEO firm matching process. And I think in this literature there have been sort of two really important and interesting developments over the last 15 years. One of which is the increasing popularity of these models of perfectly competitive and frictionless matching. Sort of Gabex Landier, Turvio, two super highly cited papers. Um, what happens in these models is that you've got these perfectly competitive, super efficient markets in which a very large number of firms compete with each other and hire all from the same pool of managerial talent, from the same pool of CEOs, and managerial ability is perfectly flexible, it's perf perfectly movable across firms. So we all want the same thing, we're all competing for the firm thing, for the same thing, and it's all very, very efficient, very, very competitive. Um, and if we also then believe that skill and firm size are complementary, which is probably true, right? A very capable person is going to create more value in a larger firm, and firm sizes are increasing over time, as they have been over the last 30, 40 years. Um, we also have a, a really good model, a really nice model that would explain why CEO compensation has increased so much. Um, so in parallel to that, we have a largely empirical literature in which, to which Claudia has contributed a lot and many others that shows in a really convincing manner that there has been this shift in the CEO labor market from firm specific skills to these general managerial skills. Both in the sense that firms seem to be demanding more of these general managerial skills. Just think of these as the ability to run stuff rather than the ability to just run one specific firm because you know it really well, just the ability to run stuff. And there's a lot of evidence that firms' demand for those general skills has been increasing, that manager supply of these general skills has been increasing, as you would expect in equilibrium, right? They're working hard on creating those skills, and the market is paying for those skills. And the reason why I'm putting these two together is, in many ways, this development here, which I believe is very real, has been very well documented, obviously should move us a lot closer to that kind of equilibrium up here in which everybody's competing for these general managerial skills. All right. So with that out of the way, um, what do we do in our paper? Well, we do something cheeky, which is we actually look at the data. Um, so we just do this. This is the simplest paper you're certainly going to see in this conference, probably one of the simplest papers you've ever seen, because it's literally just summary stats. I'm just going to show you a bunch of sub We do run a few regressions. It's going to be felt like we had to. But in all honesty, you can forget about those. This, this is a paper that entirely lives in summary statistics. And we're just going to show you some very basic patterns in the CEO labor markets, and we're going to very cheekily compare those to the predictions of these and a bunch of other models. So we're going to look at whether the CEOs that get hired by large publicly traded firms are strangers who are already very closely connected to the hiring firms. We're going to look at whether the CEOs, top executives, move around across firms, as many of these models would predict. Um, this is really sort of the focus, and then we're going to look at some differences in hiring choices across firms. We're going to look a little bit at CEO pay. Um, the focus here is purposefully going to be on very large publicly traded firms. So we're going to look at all new CEO hires in the S&P 500 from 93 to 2012. In case you're wondering, 2012, well, that's the data we had. Um, we're currently in the business of expanding um, the sample forward to 2020. So far, everything seems to be holding up perfectly well. Um, why S&P 500? Well, the idea was very much that, look, those are the largest firms. In many ways, those should be facing the fewest frictions in the CEO labor market. Right? Even if there are search costs, they're going to be a tiny percentage of the value of those firms, just hire a bunch of search firms. Um, also, we would suspect that those are the firms most likely to require these general managerial skills, because they're doing an awful lot of different things, often have very many different divisions, so you don't want a specialist who knows one piece of software particularly well. You probably want a person who can just run large companies very, very well. So as a result, we would expect those companies to come closer to that competitive and frictionless idea. The question now becomes, how close? And the message in the paper in many ways is, uh, well, not really very close at all. 
Um, so what we're showing you in the paper is that the vast majority of new CEOs have very close prior connections to the firm. And I want to emphasize before anybody gets angry, um, a lot of the results I'm going to show you today are already in the literature. So this is sort of halfway between a research paper and a survey paper. So it kind of just tries to pull a lot of the things that are in the literature already together in one place and let's, hey, let's look at those in conjunction and let's, let's think about them a little bit, what these facts mean. Um, so one of the things we are going to show you is that about 80% of new CEOs simply are insiders to the company. Insider here meaning current or former employee, current or former board member. Um, interestingly enough, that's even larger for the largest firms. So when you look at the largest firms in the S&P, all the firms here are large. Uh, but if you're looking at the very largest firms in the S&P 500, we're closer to 90%. If you're looking at smaller firms in the S&P 500, we're closer to 70%. Which is again kind of interesting because you'd expect these very largest firms to be the ones to really go after these general managerial skills, which I believe they do. Just so there happen to be other forces and we'll be pushing in the opposite direction. Um, looking at the remaining 19.6%, so the genuine outsiders, it then turns out that the majority of them, about 54%, 53%, 54% of them, are current or former co-workers of the hiring firm's directors. In other words, so even if as a director, even as a board member, you go outside the firm, you hire a genuine outsider, you hire somebody who you know pretty well, somebody you've actually worked with in some other company. So you add the two things together and you basically have the main message of the paper, which is that more than 90% of new CEOs are either genuine insiders to the company or co-workers of the directors. So in other words, we're hiring people we're really, really familiar with or that are already quite very familiar with the company. All right, then we sort of dig a little bit deeper into those outside hires. We're trying to understand, well, why don't they hire more outsiders? Maybe we can learn something from actually looking at the outsiders that are being hired. Maybe we can learn something about what the frictions here are. Probably the funnest result of, of, of that exercise is that there's very little reallocation of sitting CEOs across companies. So only about 3%, 3.2% of new CEOs are raided from a CEO position at another company. So rating here just means you literally hire the current incumbent CEO of another company. That's actually a really, really rare event. Right? And that's got to have implications for CEO pay, for CEO's outside options. That's got to have implications for CEO's career concerns, and on and on and on. Um, so who are the outsiders if it's not incumbent CEOs? Well, it turns out it's the majority of them are executives at other companies, but below the CEO levels. So if we're rating an executive from another company, we're rating the chief operating officer, a division head, a president. We're usually not rating the CEO. And then the remaining 31%, uh, so about a third of them, are what we call unattached. We didn't want to call them unemployed in case anybody gets upset because obviously they're all consulting and sitting on boards and doing other stuff. But basically people who are not currently executives at other companies. So you can just think of them as unemployed. Um, all right. Um, we're looking at CEO pay. Um, as you would expect, outsiders are more expensive than internal promotion. Um, I'm going to show you the numbers. In the hiring year, it's four or five million. You kind of have to pay something, especially if you learn somebody over from another company. But then in steady state, after the hiring year, the difference is only about <coughs> one and a half million dollars per year. Which, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm an underpaid British academic, um, or academic, <laughs> underpaid German academic in Britain. Um, but uh, so one and a half million dollars is a lot of money. But if you scale that by the size of an S&P 500 firms, that's bupkis. That's very, very little. Right? So again, this is now more a, a belief statement than a scientific statement. We have a tough time believing that those one and a half million dollars per year are the main reason why companies are so reluctant to hire outsiders or to poach CEOs from other companies. We think there's something else going on. It's not just these people are more expensive. All right, so that's the paper in a nutshell. Um, how do we interpret this? Well, let's first say something negative. Um, so clearly the, this market doesn't seem to be particularly well described by models in which firms choose from one unified pool. It's all about these general managerial skills. There seems to be something else going on. I also want to emphasize, this is not a paper where we're saying, oh, this is a big puzzle. We don't have models that explain that. We, we really do have lots of, look, open anything up in labor economy. I mean, run this by any labor economist and they're gonna go, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, that's like what every labor market looks like, right? So in many ways, we're pretty much just saying, well, kind of CEOs at the end of the day actually don't look all that different from pretty much any other labor market that labor economists have ever looked at. And the typical 
Labor Model, that we're looking at, is a model with search cost, asymmetric information, firm-specific human capital, and on and on and on. And we believe these things probably also matter a lot for CEOs, and we probably should be focusing a lot more on models that actually have those elements in them. So firm-specific human capital, asymmetric information, which in this specific context kind of means that companies know a lot more about their own employees, their own executives, than the executives of other companies, both would predict a very strong preference for insiders. Um, to be a little bit more useful here, I think we do need this asymmetric information element. So firm-specific human capital alone is not going to cut it. It's not going to be consistent with our results, even though it might play a large role, simply because we're getting this hiring of what we call the connected outsiders, so the co-workers of the directors from other firms. Now, obviously, they don't have any firm-specific human capital in the hiring firm, so the most likely explanation here is that the directors want to know the candidate, have some inside information about that candidate because they've worked together. It could also go the other way around, right? You are being hired as a new CEO. You like to know the directors who are hiring you because you're going to be working with those folks. Um, now, I want to emphasize, and we don't have much to say about this, right? This is pure speculation at this point. Up here in these interpretations, they're sort of still in a second best optimal world, right? Where the board's trying to do the right thing, which is sort of facing a bunch of frictions. Now, it may well be the case that boards are not doing the right thing. It could be agency problems, right? Maybe we're just hiring our friends, our mates, people we like. Um, it could be a behavioral issue. Right? And I think that's sort of an underexplored issue in, in this context here. We know people have home bias of various kinds. People have familiarity bias. Right? People probably overestimate the importance of people they know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there could be lots of interesting things going on here. And again, I think in many ways our paper is, if anything, a bit sort of, of a call to arms saying we should really explore these things. Right? There's, there's interesting stuff going on. Um, there is obviously some organizational behavioral literature on these last points, which I've read. <sighs> OK, uh, better not say too much about it, right? Because it's like, whatever, 30 ops. I mean, beautiful stories, amazing stories, exactly the stories you want to read. And you look at the evidence they have, and you go, ouch. Um, so kind of somebody needs to do that right, right? Somebody needs to kind of pick up exactly these probably correct hypotheses from the organizational behavior literature, and then apply our empirical toolkit to it and try to figure out what's really going on. All right, so now let me just kind of, in the remaining time that I have, just kind of run through as many of the results I have until I'm being told to shut up. All right, so let's start with this insiders versus outsiders. Um, I'm just going to show you a result that's been in the prior literature. So looking at all our 1,250 CEO hires, S&P 500, over about 30 years, um, we've got 72% internal promotions, 28% external hires. So that's a result you're going to find in a bunch of prior papers. Um, the first thing that we do that the prior literature hasn't done is we're breaking up these external hires into, well, we're looking a little bit more closely at them. And it turns out about 4% are, so four, this is always out of 100. So those numbers down here always add up to the 28%. So 4% are former executives of the company. About 7% are current or former board members. There's a lot of overlap between the two. So we pull them together. 8.4% are either former executives or current or former board members. And because that's a bit of a mouthful, I'm going to be calling these external insiders from now. Right? So the idea is they are insiders to the company, but currently external. So the prior literature would have grouped them under external hires. So then you are left with about 19.6% genuine outsiders. All right. Um, the prior literature says that percentage of genuine outsiders or just external hires has been going up a lot over time, which is true. If you're going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, there has been an increasing trend there. Um, within our sample, that's not the case. Um, now, our sample here isn't particularly long. We split it up into the three sub-periods. Let's just focus on that. So we're starting out with about 19% outsiders. We're going up to 21. But then in the last uh, seven years of our sample, we're back down to 19%. And so this and that is just exactly the same thing. So whatever upward trend there has been to outsider hiring seems to have stopped. And what I think the bigger point here is, yes, there has been a trend towards outsider hiring, but at the end of the day, it's still less than 20%, right? I think that sheer fact has been a little bit lost. Like 80% is still insiders. All right. Um, now, let's focus in on those 19.6% outsiders. Um, the first point that we're making here is that, well, a lot of these outsiders are actually really closely connected to the hiring firm's directors already. 
And you can look at this in a bunch of ways. This is a fairly tight way. We're literally just saying, do the hiring, do the directors, or does the new CEO, has the new CEO previously worked with at least one of the hiring firm directors in the same company or sat on the same board as one of the hiring firm's directors? And when we do that exercise using Bordex data, we find that in 53% of the cases, the answer is yes. So 53% of these outside hires have previously worked with at least one of the hiring firm's directors. So they're personally known to these people in a professional capacity. And obviously, once you add in all these other connections you can do with Bordex, the social stuff and philanthropy and whatnot, that goes up a little bit. Um, or whatever, same school, it goes up again. But I always viewed those as slightly dodgy. I never knew how reliable those were. So this one is pretty tight. This is literally just you have worked together. Now, again, you mind saying, oh, 53%, is that a big number? Is that a small number? Um, you need to benchmark it to something. So we're comparing it to alternative CEOs you could have hired very loosely. So the idea is CEOs that were hired by other companies in your industry by firms of roughly the same size within roughly the same time period. We run the same exercise, and we're getting that 13% of these hypothetical alternative hires would have been connected to your board. So it looks like the 53% thingy isn't accidental. And then you add everything together and you have sort of the main result of the paper, more than 90% of new CEOs are from the firm's current or former executives, current or former board members, or co-workers of its directors. All right, um, let's dive deeper into the outsiders. When you hire an outsider, you could do one of three things. You could poach somebody else as CEO, you could poach somebody below the CEO level, or you could hire somebody unemployed. So what do we find? So we have got 19.6% of those folks. 2.8% are rated CEOs. So 2.8% of the time, you're hiring an outsider by rating somebody else's CEO. The majority, uh, apologies, the majority are executives at other companies, right? But not CEOs. So you're poaching a division manager, a division head, a president, a CEO. About 6% are unemployed. Um, we're doing the same exercise just for completeness for the external insiders. So those are the folks that are former executives or current or former board members. And unsurprisingly, the vast majority, so 8.4% of those in total, 6.5% of the 8.4, unsurprisingly, are unemployed. Because that's a lot of your former executives that are just retired and you're bringing those back. I won't have time to show you that. You usually bring those back when you're in a deep, deep crisis, when you're doing really, really badly. It's when you bring back one of your former executives. And then just to make clear where that 3.2% came from earlier, if you add these two together, we're basically finding that only 3.2% of, of new CEO hires are rated from CEO positions at other firms. Okay, in the remaining minute or so, a little bit more about the rates because those are kind of fun. We started out this paper to wanting to write about rates. And then we said, there aren't any. And we said, OK, that project is dead. And then we turned around and said, that's kind of interesting that there aren't any rates. We should write about that. So this ended up being a paper about there are no rates. But let's quickly look at them, because they're fun. So when we're rating somebody, we're rating either below CEO executive or we're rating a CEO. Notice there are only 40 cases right, in the entire US S&P 500 over 30 years. It really doesn't happen. Um, so who do we rate from? Short answer, US public firms. So if we rate somebody else's CEO, 80% of the time is from another US public firm, and the rest is basically private US firms. So it's not an international market. You're not got anybody from the US, anybody from the UK. There's one German guy in there. The SAP guy didn't work out. Um, so they probably won't do that again. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's a pretty insular market here, basically US companies. Probably the most interesting result here are the size differences. So if you're rating a below CEO executive, you're rating somebody from a very large firm. So basically think you're rating a division manager from General Electric. Um, when you're rating a CEO, you're rating somebody from a much, 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 much smaller firm. And it becomes stark when you look at the size difference between the hiring firm and the firm from which you're hiring. So if you're rating a below CEO executive, you're rating somebody, on, av on average, you're rating from a company that's about four times your own size. If you're rating a CEO, you're rating on, on average from a company, actually those are medians, the averages are even more extreme. You're typically rating from a company that's about a quarter of your own size. Right? And that's a pattern that we see in various ways, which I think suggests that if you want to rate a CEO, if you want to convince a CEO to leave her job and join your company, you've got to offer a really big price. Right? You've got to basically offer, hey, you get to run a company that's four times as large as the company you're currently rating. So I think companies are facing massive supply constraints. All right, 
I'm out of time, so let me skip over that because I've already talked about it. Um, if I can just take 10 seconds, I just want to show you that the pay differences across those different categories are not particularly large. So skipping any details of how it's calculated, trust me, I've done it for 20 years. Um, so trust me that we, that we have a rough idea how to do that. The big message here is that outsiders are more expensive. So this is sort of abnormal compensation. And in the hiring year, it's going to cost you four to five million to bring in an outsider. Afterwards, that's down to about 1.6, 1.7 million per year. So yes, they are more expensive, and there aren't actually particularly large differences across what type of outsider you bring in, but you scale that by the size of an S&P 500 firm, it really doesn't seem to be a particularly big deal. So kind of, I think we need to know that to interpret what's going on here. All right, totally out of time. So I hope to have convinced you that firms hire CEOs they're already very familiar with, little reallocation of CEOs across firms. And to us, that just means that we need to think about models that have features that deliver those results, right? So we kind of don't want to write down models in which CEOs are moving around like crazy across firms all the time. Every CEO has massive career concerns and everything is determined by outside options in a perfectly competitive market because it doesn't seem to describe the world. And that has big implications for CEO pay, for CEO career concerns and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Claudia Custodio. Thanks so much for inviting me to be here and discuss this, uh, this great paper. It's an important paper. Um, let me uh, just, as usual, do a very brief summary of, of the paper and, um, and the main findings. So basically, the paper tries to understand how efficient CEO hiring is and what models best describe it. And the main finding is that firms hire from a surprisingly, and I will highlight surprisingly small, uh, pool of, of candidates. So boards are already familiar with more than 90% of the new CEOs. Um, 80, around 80% are insiders and 72% are promoted internally. In terms of methodology, it's nothing fancy. This is pure descriptive, which is great. Um, and um, as for the contribution, what I would highlight is that this informs and demands for new theories or revised theories, which, which is uh, really good, I, I would say, as well. So in terms of the interpretation and, and conclusion, so um, I just picked one of the sentences. So it says, explaining how findings requires both firm-specific human capital and asymmetric learning. So we would need the, the models to, um, to pick up on, on, on this. And um, to explain the, the, the high and, and increase in CO pay, um, it might be that during due to growing rents from firm-specific skills or its event information, uh, or due to CEO capturing a growing share of these rents, this would explain the increase in um, CEO compensation. Okay, so I have a really tough task uh, here. So the paper has been presented everywhere, and I'm just uh, one more. Actually, I had something for you. Let me see if this works. There is no sound. I had the Mission Impossible theme song. <laughs> I can sing it for you. No, not going to do that. Uh, but this is really Mission Impossible, uh, trying to say something uh, new, given that the paper has been presented in so many uh, different, um, in so many different uh, places and, and uh, has had so many different uh, uh, high-profile discussions. So this is just to set your expectations right, yes, that <laughs> uh, with respect to what I can do uh, discussing this, uh, this paper. But let me, um, let me focus on probably one small point, which is probably what my compet competitive advantage is going to be, with this, which is this idea uh, about firm-specific skills versus more general uh, skills. So, but before getting there, so my, my first point um, is, okay, so we, we know that firms hire from a surprisingly small pool of candidates, right? And these, in terms of these internal versus external, we are talking about 72%. 
my first question is, but what would be the benchmark, right? So if this doesn't matter, would it be 50-50, right? So 50% internals, 50% externals. So what would it um, be? And then, again, with regards to interpretation, the fact that this is hard to reconcile with models of labor market in which CEOs are chosen for their general skills. So that's what I'm going to try to challenge a little bit, okay? And try to um, argue that the two things are not necessarily incompatible, right? The fact that we might do need this firm specific, but that these might also be quite generalist type of, uh, of skills. Um, so the, 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 the first, thought I have for you is this notion that firms, uh, sorry, that uh, the managers can accumulate both the firm specific and the general skills. And in fact, the way they accumulate these general skills is just by moving around different positions inside the firm, different firms, different industries. So one of my points is that, well, if these managers that run the S&P 500 uh, firms have made their careers by moving around. Maybe it is not super unlikely that at some point they build a connection with, um, with the firm we are talking about, right? So it's this idea that, well, because you, are, you became a generalist, because you moved more and more, potentially at some point you just established this, uh, this connection. And, and the second point I want to make is that, well, maybe these internals also have a lot of these general skills um, and that these might have been acquired previously to these internal promotion. Okay, so they might have indeed uh, be generalists before uh, being uh, uh, acquired. So let me... Um, so for those of you who have been here uh, before, so this is again shameless self-promotion, but now number three, because I mentioned two of my own papers yesterday while discussing uh, another paper. But actually, this is not my own paper. So this is um, a very recent working paper by Jeff Coles and, and co-authors, where they, using data from Incentive Lab, they replicate this correlation between uh, general ability index and, um, and CEO pay. So this general ability index was one, in one of my previous uh, papers with Miguel Fred and Pedro Mach, where we document this correlation between the general ability of managers and CEO pay and how you can see this, uh, this trend, right? And um, so this is, this is updated to 2016. It's somehow comforting to see that with different data and updated sample that this correlation is still there and, and it is pretty strong. So, so let me now build up on, on, on this. So I also went to the data and the first thing that I did was sort of um, to replicate the main result of, of, of the paper with the whole of um, ExecuComp. Well, this is ExecuComp matched with, with Bordex and not focusing just on the S&P 500 and, well, the 70% is there, right? So these, these are the percentage of internal CEOs. So that's basically Dirk's paper over there. So here what um, I would like to highlight, right, is that if we go to, so these EX, like not on a major S&P index, we get much closer to what would be this 50%. So I think this is really interesting. And, I, well, Dirk has pointed out this already, right, that... Uh, they seem to be mainly there for, even amongst the S&P 500, it's for the really large, and going outside the S&P 500, right? So we see that the percentage of internal CEOs goes, goes down. I think that's interesting um, to, to notice. So the other thing I wanted to highlight is that, well, now uh, what we have here is this average GAI. So this is the GAI index aims to capture, um, it tells on the previous graph, aims to capture how general the managerial capital is. And um, so what we have here is just this average GAI 
uh, again, for different uh, groups of companies from Execucom. So this would be for the S&P. And as you see, the, the S&P 500 are the ones that get the highest uh, average GAI when compared to, to the other ones. OK, so maybe as, as expected, so now what, what I'm going to do next is to compare the CEOs that were externally hired with the ones that were internally hired and ask, well, do these guys, are these guys generalists or, or not? So by the way, I, I forgot to mention that the index is standardized to have zero mean. So you can very simply think that a number above zero would be a generalist and below zero would be a specialist. Well, obviously simplifying things a lot, but just, just as a simple rule to follow. So here what we see is that as expected, this, the CEOs that are hired externally, they have a quite high average GAI index. And perhaps this is not surprising. What I would argue that maybe it's a bit more surprising and consistent with what I was mentioning before, that perhaps it's both. It's the firm specific together with this uh, general ability that you have once you go to these uh, internal promoted, these guys are also generalists, okay? So, so they do have, they also, they don't score as high as the external, maybe as expected, but they also score really high. And, and, and the ones, especially the ones in uh, S&P 500, right? So I'm, I'm basically highlighted what would be the same sample as index uh, uh, paper, maybe not as much, right? So on the rest of, of the companies, it's is, is interesting that, the internals are actually are is are actually specialists. So, I guess what this highlights is that these group of S and P five hundred firms are probably very special. Um, um, yes. So, the second point, and 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 this is this is my, this is basically one point that I want to make. Um, my second point is, is to, to, to think a little bit about this definition of, of being an internal, okay? And, and as Dirk was describing, they basically what they did was they, they tried to understand where these external hires were coming from. So to, to some extent, at, at the end of the spectrum, you would have a purely external, absolutely no relation to the firm CEO, and at the other side of the spectrum, you would have a purely internal has spent all of his life inside the company, never moved anywhere, right? And then you have everything in between, right? And what um, I feel that, that, that the paper does is it's sort of to focus on the right side of the spectrum and to say, well, look, let's dig a little bit deeper on these externals. Are they really externals? So what sort of links do they have? And here my point would just be, well, if these firm-specific skills are super important, maybe an avenue for research could be, okay, so let's also focus on the other side of, of the spectrum and let's try to understand what are these firm-specific skills that they need, that they are bringing in, right? And, um, and then ask yourself, so is it just enough to have been a worker at some point or for how long do they have to be? Do they have to be in the firm in a specific role, right? So were they uh, chief operating officers, right? So maybe being chief of operating officers, they can um, uh, acquire a lot of uh, operational experience that, that is needed, as opposed to say CFO, that it's something much more uh, general. So um, just the thought. So the, the, the last, different point I want to make is, um, and, and speaking to these heterogeneity, right? So it, it, this strikes me that there's something special about these S&P 500 firms, right? So what is that? Because um, this is just a, 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 from not too long ago. So this is 2016, but in the FT you could read that uh, last year 58% of new UK chief executives came from another company versus 23% globally, which would um, 
match the main effect, right? So, so according to uh, PwC, you have, we have that in the UK, it seems to go the other way around. It's, it's only 52%. Uh, so why would that be? Is it, is it the case that in the UK, they wouldn't need as much these firm-specific skills? What, what is it? Okay, so super important, relevant uh, question. Hard to discuss paper. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's important. It's an important paper, okay? So, so, so there's new evidence that these internal hires uh, are a substantial fraction of, of the hires for these S&P 500 uh, firms. Um, so it does speak to new models. Um, yeah, and my question is, this, this is, seems to be something specific. Are we talking about segmented markets? What, what is it? Thank you. I really enjoyed thinking even more about this. But... Okay. Um, thank you so much, Claudia. This was an absolutely brilliant discussion. And in many ways, I'd like right now kind of declare victory. Because in many ways, the purpose of this paper is to get people like Claudia and other experts in this area to think really hard about exactly these issues. And you're saying it's hard to discuss. Try bloody writing the thing, <laughs> right? Because, look, you have a bunch of facts, and you're kind of going, well, this is really interesting. And it's kind of inconsistent with a lot of the stuff that we've been doing. So now what the hell does it mean? Right? And now we need to start thinking about exactly these things. So what exactly is the importance of firm-specific skills, asymmetric information, general managerial skills? How do these things interact with each other? And we need to look at a lot more things. The paper's already bloody long, right? I mean, you saw it. Um, we need to look at a lot more things. And looking across the spectrum of firm sizes, which you did, and this was absolutely great, right, is, is exactly the way to go. Because even within the S&P 500, we see differences between like the 100 largest firms and the 100 smallest firms. And those are all bloody big firms. So what happens when you look at the S&P small cap? You just showed us a bit of evidence, right? You're down to 55%. What happens when you look internationally, right? So kind of want to almost write the same paper for the UK, for Germany, for Japan, start trying to see what's going on. Um, let me just make one last point, and then I'm going to, uh, would like to take uh, other questions. What's the right benchmark here? Now, so I want to push a little bit on that. We didn't want to be too brutal about that in the paper, and I think we, we just have to be. If you take these models, the sort of frictionless matching models, ser literal, it's zero. I mean, if literally everybody just hires, if there's just this big pool of top executives out there, and we're just looking at these general managerial skills, we're just ranking this big pool of people, it would be only by sheer coincidence that you would hire somebody who already happens to be in your own firm. So zero is a bit silly, it's like one over 500 if you're in the S&P 500, and that's the relevant pool. But it's, why is it the S&P 500? So on some level, if you take these models excessively seriously, the appropriate benchmark would be zero. You should never be hiring any of your own executives. Now, the moment you say this out loud, everybody goes like, well, yeah, but look like these guys aren't that stupid. They don't mean this literally. And I agree with you. Obviously, it's a model, and we don't want to like, overemphasize sort of the straw man nature of the model too much. But at the end of the day, it, it's kind of what the model says. Right? You, in those models, there's absolutely no reason to ever hire anybody who's already in your company. And all we're really just saying is we kind of sort of need, without in any way arguing that the general skills don't matter, I absolutely believe they matter enormously. And um, we're just saying, well, at the end of the day, the tiebreaker seems to be, then yeah, at the end of the day, you kind of always go for somebody who's already in your company. Um, so there seems to be a lot more stuff that matters in addition to the general skills. Sorry. Great. So I have um, Dan first. Yeah. yeah, so I, it's a fascinating paper, and I guess for somebody... Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Thank you. For somebody who's keenly interested in Japan, always the story is, you know, Japan are insider-dominated firms, um, lifetime employees, and the U.S. is a yeah. is a very liquid labor market, yeah. right? So I I I love this because it yeah. it of course paints a very different picture. Yeah. But my question is this: Of course, in Japan, and you mentioned it at the end to compare other countries, which I think is great. The definition of insider yeah. is you graduate from the university yeah. and you work yeah. in the same company for your entire yeah. career. And I think Claudia was sort yeah. of touching on this yeah. when she showed the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. What may be going on in the U.S. is you may actually be getting you know, succession planning at mm -hmm. the sub-CEO level, yeah. right? So you're getting a liquid labor market throughout. Mm -hmm. Sub-CEO level, you're getting a population of potential yeah. candidates. Mm -hmm. 
and then they're drafting from those potential yeah. candidates, which which would be distinctly yeah. different, and it would still show a liquidity, yeah. and it would show hunting through the labor market, yeah. but you're just observing in yeah. your statistics the final step. Yeah. You're not observing yeah. the lower step, and I, I, I think that actually the comparison between Japan and the United States would probably show the starkest difference, yeah. where you would find a huge difference, but you're not observing it at the top. Yeah. So I wonder how you how you would respond to that. Can Should you take a can punch? Can we take yeah. another Let's take two? A punch and Rui so first. I take notes soon. Uh, one one empirical benchmark for your analysis might be. Um, Deans at academic institutions, mm -hmm. where my, I, you know, my empirical observation would be 50-50, but that's just the empirical yeah. benchmark. And yeah. there, there, yeah. they're probably much more generalists. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but there might be a component associated yeah. with the specific skills. But yeah. um, on, on related to the interpretation of the evidence, so um, and correlated with what Dan was suggesting is, is that it could be a, uh, an internal market yeah. for you know CEOs as well at these larger co corporations yeah. where. You know, there's many very large corporations within a large corporation, yes. and you know there could be competition for the top job, yeah. uh, and so that that's much more likely at the very high end than at the smaller company. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. So one, uh, just to add to what Claudia and Dan said, uh, it's not only succession planning because uh, the most extreme scenario of what you can think of is that uh, we're facing an activist campaign and the activist puts a board member uh, on the board and then there's a takeover and then they uh, essentially uh, join the board. And this person definitely is anything but an insider, uh, but in your methodology it seems to show up as yeah. such and therefore I think you should really look into who's an insider and uh, have that definition. Okay. I just, yeah, okay, so let's just pick up on the last point first. We did that. Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously we're not that silly to saying, oh, if somebody joined six months before or a year before or something like that. So we obviously play around with that because it's a, it's a very valid point, obviously. It's very well taken. Um, so let's break it down into two things. Number one, sort of this very short-term thing. Do I just hire somebody from the outside with the plan to make that person a CEO a year or two or three later? So basically you can exclude anybody remotely looks like that and the results barely budge. So that's not the story that's going on. Um, and I don't have the numbers in my head right now, they're in the paper, but something like the median tenure in the firm is like seven, eight years or something like that, and the average is like 17 or something really crazy. So the vast majority of them have actually been around for quite some time. At the same time, I think the point about the succession planning is extremely well taken. So maybe the right model, it, just to be emphasized, right, it would be a very different model from the one that we've been using, right? But maybe the right model is exactly one where sort of the liquid labor market is happening earlier, right? And we're bringing these people in five years before, 10 years before, internal career development, all of the stuff our HR friends are talking about. That's probably very much going on. So maybe that's the kind of model that we want, which suddenly makes these things very, very important because we don't have this liquid market at the very top, that all that stuff happens earlier. And then for those of us interested in CO pay, that's going to have massive impact implications for how to think about CO pay, right? Because at the end of this process, you're going to have two, three internal candidates kind of competing for that one position. That's far away from a perfectly competitive market, right? Now suddenly, and let's be honest, at the end of the day, maybe one of those looks considerably stronger than the other two. That person suddenly is going to have an awful lot of bargaining power, right? So now suddenly we need a very, very different model of how CO pay is determined. So again, I would absolutely love if it turned out that in response to the little summary stats we've put up here, people were to figure out that that is the right model and that's the model we need to work with. Um, very quickly, um, sorry, I can't read myself. Um, so we talked about the internal market hiring earlier. Oh yeah, deans. Um, so again, I think it would be very, very interesting to look across different professions and different areas. Um, other people have suggested to us um, sports coaches. Right, so when you friends look at football teams, or oh, soccer teams for the Americans in the room, um, it's essentially all intern, uh, external, right? You never, never really, so if when a coach gets fired, it is extremely rare that you're going to promote an assistant coach and saying, yeah, you now get to run the thing. Um, so that seems to be a completely different market, and again, we probably need to think about why. Um, Okay, Tom Grosny. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, Dirk, as you know, I advised boards for 20 years on CEO pay, so this is going to be very much an anecdotal comment rather than, anecdote, uh, rather than an academic one. But um, first of all, I think the point around succession happening at CEO minus one is absolutely spot on and, and, and does need to be investigated more. But the other point I wanted to make is that if you're a director 
on a board and, and you have to get a new CEO, right? Your heart really sinks, right? It's a load of work. There's massive risk associated with it. And I suspect if you look at the data, you'll find that where CEO hires go wrong really, really quickly, it's often when it's been an outside hire and it's found actually it didn't work out. And that's the nightmare position for directors to be in. So I think quite often the internal hire is also a lower risk option for the director because the chances are at least you won't have to go through all of this again within your tenure at that firm. So I just wondered whether there was something about the prior circumstances of firms doing external hires because often to get over that hump of doing external hire it's when you've had a real disaster situation. So we saw that for example you know after the banks all, all, you know, all collapsed in a financial crisis in the UK etc etc. So it's quite often after there's been a real mess that boards have the incentive to go external. Um, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Alexander Helgard from Regensburg University. Uh, I have a comment which is uh, actually relating to something which was just said. Did you look at the reasons for CEO turnover? So um, if somebody's fired, uh, is it more likely that an external one is hired uh, than if you have yeah. a normal succession, so that's also yeah. going to the succession planning? Or yeah. is it directly opposite? Can you say something yeah. on that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yes. Um, as I was listening to you, and it's a fascinating story, I just wondered whether law has any role in this. I mean, I was thinking that obviously sometimes if a CEO is shifting during the term of the contract to a competing firm, there'd be real fiduciary issues there and the potential that the person would be breaching their fiduciary duties. Uh, and that's certainly a risk under UK Australian law. Uh, but then, of course, Claudia told us the UK is totally different. So that, that floored me. But yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the role of law. Okay. Um, so uh, starting with Tom and Alexander's point, which, which clearly sort of overlapped, I, you're exactly right. So I think that the paraphrasing here, um, getting a new CEO is a nightmare for a board. And for the longest time, I actually wanted to write a paper. I just can't figure out how to do it. Um, arguing that boards are almost inevitably must be excessively conservative in the CEOs they hire. Right? Sort of the old adage, nobody gets hired, nobody gets fired for um, buying IBM. Right? So there's sort of, there's got to be an equivalent here in the CEO labor market where you don't get fired if you go with the safe option, right? The obvious internal candidate, or then if you go externally, you go for somebody very well established, somebody with a ton of experience, who also happens to be bloody expensive, but at least you're not going to get st look stupid afterwards if it doesn't work out. So I think just the way board members' incentives are set up, they're very asymmetric. If you hire somebody great, very few people will remember that you were the person to hire that person. On the other hand, if you hire somebody who turns into a disaster and two years later you have to fire that person, you're going to bear a lot of the cost of that. So I think it's very natural to think that board members will be rationally excessively conservative in their hiring. It's a clever thought, everybody nods. I don't know how to turn that into a paper. I don't know how to actually show that. Even though I'm pretty convinced exactly that's true. And then sort of to address the point that both of you asked, you're absolutely right. You go externally when you've performed badly. Um, and really badly. And the worse you've performed, the more likely you are to go externally. Um, I didn't emphasize that. That's in the prior literature. So that's a well-established result in the prior literature. We have it as well, obviously. Um, the one wrinkle we add to that, what I think is quite interesting, is if you do really, really badly, you're also unusually likely to bring back one of your former executives, which again, there's a paper on come, uh, papers on comeback CEOs that already shows that. But in many ways, thinking about the right model, that's really interesting because it suggests exactly at the moment when things have gone really, really well, you don't go to that awesome pool of general ability out there. That's exactly the moment where you want somebody who either really knows your firm very, very well already or who you know very well already. And again, I think we need a model that kind of gives us um, that law. Um, I think this is a big deal. I mean, we need to figure out what's the friction that prevents CEOs from switching companies. Um, and talking to search consultants, um, they tell you very simply, and that's very consistent with what Jennifer said, um, a sitting CEO is not going to return our phone call. 
Right? If the board were to ever, if we call up a sitting CEO and saying, would you be interested in working for another company, they're never going to return our phone call. Because if anybody on their board were to find out, that would be a made, I'm not making a legal statement, I'm not a lawyer, but that would be viewed as a major breach of trust. If that leaked out, shareholders would be very, very upset about that. So one of the, I, again, I don't know how to write a model of that, but one of the sort of very real world frictions is that it's going to be very, very difficult to hire a sitting CEO because you can't go through the normal vetting process. You can't put a sitting CEO through an assessment center. It's completely impossible. So the only way you can actually hire a sitting CEO of a large publicly traded company is by basically cold calling that person and offering the job. It's the only way to do it. Right? So that's what I've been told. And it kind of makes sense. Um, now, when do you do that? Well, only if you're bloody desperate. Right? So that's basically the point where if you've completely run out of any other options, you're saying, screw it, we're not going to do an assessment center. We've searched, we've been turned down four times. with us finding that you only do that to CEOs at a company that are on average about a quarter of your own size. Right? You're basically completely desperate at this point and you're just offering something, a very sexy job to somebody at a much, much smaller company in the hope that person is going to take it. Again, I think that's what's going on. I'm not entirely sure how to fit that into one of our models. Um, is it legal frictions? Is it just some other kind of equilibrium trying to figure it out? Jeff? What about a tournament model? Uh, Sherwin Rosen had, had one that for a while seemed, seemed to be an important way to explain this, but that sort of is, is really why we would do internal hiring because mm -hmm. A, we want to I mean, retain a, a, a very strong group and the yeah. notion is that if you are the winner, then yeah. we'll select you and, and without that yeah. bonus, uh, I mean, without the payoff at the end, then you don't motivate the internal model. Uh, uh, the tournament yeah. internally, and, and yeah. that also fits the generalist yeah. story, so you move, yeah. move around. I mean, if yeah. it's a big enough Absolutely. firm, you get a lot of yeah. general skills, yeah. et cetera, but that also explains yeah. the high pay and, yeah. you know, a lot of things. That seems yeah. to have gone, gone out of yeah. fashion, it seems, from the way you describe the alternative models I, here. I, to be honest, I cut it for lack of, for lack of, oh yeah, apologies. So do, do you have any detailed data on, on the CEO hire uh, at the time of takeover or, or in, in normal times? So my intuition would be that um, in, in takeovers, um, there will be more hire from, from outside, yeah. for example, yeah. when, when buyout, buyout fund uh, acquires a fund, that yeah. they, they usually have a pool yeah. of CEO candidates. Mm -hmm. While and in, 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 in normal times, uh, usually the companies yeah. have the CEO succession plan where, of course, the in, insider would have uh, much advantage yeah compared to Offsider. Last? Is it last or does anyone want to? Then Ron, okay. No, I very much uh, agree that the reason to hire the CEO, whether it's retirement or disruption or poor performance, uh, will matter very much if we are going to get for an internal or external candidate. I was wondering if you have any data on non-compete clauses and how this affects yeah. Um, getting outside candidates. Yeah. Um, oh, this is a fantastic and question. Final, fin oh, sorry, final oh, question. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, regard, with regard to the UK, in the UK there is this figure of the CEO interim that allows you to appoint someone yeah. while you're looking for someone else, yeah. and that might explain yeah. maybe why you are uh, hiring more outsiders, because you have this interim figure. Yeah. We take one last question from sure. Ron. Uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, you know, obviously, uh, this is saying that, to me at least, that the expertise, the firm and the industry expertise of the candidate is extremely important. Uh, but it raises questions in my mind about, well, what's the function or what's the value of search firms that are uh, being hired to select these candidates when, in fact, uh, most of them are going to be uh, people that are... <laughs> close at hand. Um, I also uh, wonder whether there might be any uh, value in looking at uh, uh, whether there's a shock effect when um, um, the listing rules under SOX are suddenly required full independence of the nominating committee and whether that caused any changes to the behavior. That's very interesting. Um, 
I'm going to try to be very quick. Um, let, this is a lame answer, but we obviously talk a lot about tournament models in the data because you're absolutely right. It fits with a ton of what we're showing here. Um, you know I was already running out of time. I had to cut something. Um, so I cut, I cut a slide out about that. Um, I think that is potentially a really good explanation. Right. Again, we're sort of, it's sort of a call to arms to figure out which one of these multitude of models that we have that would potentially be consistent with many of the moments in the data that we're showing you are actually going on. Um, to push, to just saying it's probably not all that's going on. There are companies that clearly do tournaments. Um, so looking at just reading the tournament literature, this is not our contribution. Um, just reading the tournament literature, there clearly are companies that do these tournaments to get to a CEO. There are many other companies that very explicitly shut down the tournaments, sort of by literally just nominating and saying this person will be the CEO in the future, three years time, four years time, in the future. Um, and again, there are probably good reasons for that because you don't actually want your top executives to compete with each other because they might be screwing things up, they might be sabotaging things. So for a subset of the firms, it might just be tournaments, might be the entire answer. Then there's probably another subset of firms for which it's not the answer. And again, sort of agenda going forward, we need to figure out to what extent tournaments explain what we're seeing here. Um, takeovers, um, apologies, takeovers. Um, we don't have anything particularly clever to say about it, but um, Steve Kaplan just came out with a paper, unsurprisingly, okay, let me be an ass since he isn't here, replicating what we're doing, no, um, doing exactly what we're doing, but doing it for private equity-owned companies, so basically largely buyout companies, and finds the exact opposite. Um, and I kind of knew that he was working on that because whenever I was presenting this, he was kind of sitting in the room smirking in the background saying, hey, 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 I'm doing something that's going to look very different. And it's, it's a great paper because of very similar to what Claudia showed us, things seem to be working quite differently in different corners of the world, which for us as empiricists is exciting because now we can try to st start understanding why that is. So private equity companies do hire a lot of external CEOs. So, I mean, one interpretation is, I'm not trying to put words into Steve's mouth, but I think what Steve is thinking is that the public companies are getting it wrong. Um, so basically, sort of what I alluded to earlier as agency problems slash potentially behavioral stuff, he seems to think, I mean, he may have a point that the public companies are doing way too much internal stuff, because probably, probably because they're too conservative. And once you bring in these highly motivated, super smart, super awesome walk on water, Steve's view, um, private equity guys, they're doing everything right, and they're doing a lot of external CEOs, right? So that's certainly one of the dimensions, I think, to look into and to push on where we can learn something from. Um, Non-competes. I don't have anything particularly clever to say about it because we don't have data on non-competes per se. Um, we do the cheap thing on throwing in that non-compete enforceability index of Mark Gamay's and to see whether that predicts anything. In our data, it doesn't seem to predict anything at all. So there doesn't seem to be a difference in the US between companies headquartered in states where you can enforce versus not enforce non-compete agreements. Talking to board members, um, Tom just stepped out of the room. Tom is a co-author and he's been working with boards forever. Talking to people like Tom and others, um, what we've been told, and I'm just passing this on this, Forget non-competes when it comes to CEOs. They're very, very important for like scientists and mid-level managers and everything else. They're a big deal. With a CEO, you cannot enforce a non-compete because what you're going to do? Tell a CEO that you must keep working for this company even though you don't want to, otherwise we're going to... No, it just, it just basically doesn't work. So I'm just passing that on. Maybe that, maybe that is the case. Um, I'm not going to say anything clever about the UK because I'm still quite baffled by the UK market, but Tom is what would be the specialist on that. Um, search firms. Um, great question. What the hell do search firms do? I think that's another agenda we need to dig into. Um, with Alex Edmonds and Tom, we just did a survey of board members and, and talking to them about how they think about all of these issues. And one of the questions we get asked a lot, you should be talking to the search, comp search firms and try to figure out what the hell they are doing. It turns out there is actually a really, really nice paper by three LSE academics, oddly enough, from the geography department, who like 50 unpublished working papers, who like 10, 15 years ago actually talked to the search companies, the, uh, the search firms in the UK. So it's a different uh, setting. And to summarize very unfairly, search companies, obviously most important when you go externally, which seems to be happening more in the UK. Secondly, very much about downside protection. So they're not about finding the greatest CEO or the best CEO. They're very much about cutting out the left tail of the distribution. So not hiring somebody who has committed sexual harassment in a previous job. Not hiring somebody who's done something terrible in a previous job. Again, board members are very risk averse. And the last thing they want to have is hire somebody and six months later 
big, big article on the front page of the FT saying that person did X, Y, Z in a prior job. So search firms seem to be a lot about that, sort of cutting out the lunatics, the criminals, the people who've done terrible things in prior jobs, rather than optimizing on the upside and trying to find a great CEO. But we need to do a lot more work on search firms because I don't think we really understand what they're doing. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Claudia. It was a great session. Please join me in thanking all the speakers.